It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. You couldn't make this stuff up, man. Across distances they were never meant to fly. This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. The planes can be too much to handle. It's like a caveman trying to figure out the Concorde. The pilot's too exhausted to fly at night. All you can see is black, there's no horizon, there's nothing. There's a lot of pilots that have died just because of that. But as long as there's money and fuel to burn, are we gonna live today? I think so. Yeah, They'll live to fly another day. On the last leg of a 19,000 kilometer marathon, two ferry pilots race to the finish line in a state-of-the-art Phenom jet. See Vegas. It's an airport right there. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Marcio Lucchese has flown plenty of these babies. But this is the first jet flight for Kerry McCauley, and he'll be landing it in front of the new owner. Dude, land there, land there. Autopilot. Start putting up flaps, start slowing down. If you're shelling out three and a half million bucks on an executive jet, you want it handled with kid gloves. Figuring full flaps, no warning lights. Sink rate, pull up. Pull up a little bit. Sink rate. There you go, just a little, uh, beautiful. A little bit of power now. All right, don't dive now, just keep it, keep it. Nose up, nose up. Nose up. Perfect, my friend, perfect. Well, that's my boy. And start breaking. More breaking, more breaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great thing, guy. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations with the new airplane. Thank it was you. a pleasure, huh? Hey, you guys we did a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. If anyone deserves to celebrate right now, it's Carrie. Oh, it tastes good after a long flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This trip, flying halfway around the globe, from Australia to America, was his trial by fire. Cabin. 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 Learning to take Cabin. orders from a computer. Stall. Stall. And trying to hold it together when everything's falling apart. Kerry did really well. I was not expecting for him to pick up as quick as he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man, looking forward to do it again. Yeah, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but uh, you can teach an old pilot how to fly a jet, apparently. Kerry might have plans to cool his heels in Vegas, but he won't get the chance. Yeah, it seems to be a nice plane. I haven't seen it myself, but the broker told me it was nice. Back at head office, boss Corey Benson just landed a big contract to deliver a plane to Argentina. And he wants Kerry on it right away. This is Kerry. Hey, Kerry, it's Corey Benson, CB Aviation. How are you? I've got a, a trip that just came up extremely quickly. I need you to captain a, a Navajo down to Argentina. Yeah, sure, no problem. There was another ferry company that was doing the flight, and they uh, quit halfway through. So the client called me in a panic and is begging for us to do it. This is a chance for Corey to grow his new business and to succeed where others have failed. I had no idea how I was going to put it all together, but in this business, you got to be able to make things happen. The rush is on. Best case scenario for me is I don't hear from them. The plane takes off, they handle any issues that comes up, and I get a phone call that the airplane's delivered in Argentina. The plane is a 79 Piper Navajo Chieftain, a stretch limo version of the regular Navajo with souped up engines. Carries back in his element with the kind of plane he's flown for 20 years. Check the oil, oil capsule, all secure. 11 in the right and then uh, 10 and a half in the left. His co-pilot on Corey's rush job is Stu Sprung, a guy he's flown with once before. This opportunity came up very last second, but I was able to free myself up and get here um, in a day's notice, essentially. Stu's a far less experienced pilot with a fraction of the flying time Kerry's got under his belt. Just about all set? Yep. So on this flight, there's no question who's in the driver's seat. 
I've been chosen to be captain or however we want to want to put that. So, you know, we're going to we're going to be working as a team on this. Every, you know, all the decisions will be basically mutual. But if push comes to shove and someone needs to make a decision, I guess that'll kind of fall to me. All right. Let's get out of here. Right, 360 clear for takeoff, 608. We got gas on the main. We got an undercarriage. We got a mixture. We got props. Do you want to take off? Sure. Right away, Kerry gives Stu the chance to show his stuff. I will get the gear. A little heavy. Your nose down. Gear coming up. Nose down, nose down, nose down, nose down. OK, you got it? Yep, got Got the controls. They'll head first to the islands of Turks and Caicos, then fly another 8,000 kilometers south all the way down to Argentina. Roger. Roger, sounds so much more sexy down south. But as they approach Turks and Caicos, Kerry spots trouble. Boy, that gauge is kind of pegged. Yeah, you're right, it's not vibrating. I do not like that. No, I mean, we're not at an extreme power setting at all. The oil temperature gauge shows the right engine is running hot. The right engine always does burn a little hotter. Cylinder head is normal, and the oil temp is super hot. It's just not making any sense. Still, it makes me nervous. I don't like a needle touching the red line. If it's not that gauge, we could cook this engine in a heartbeat. If the engine is overheating, it could set the whole plane on fire. I want to get this thing on the ground. Yeah. I don't want to screw around. That gauge is making me really nervous. nervous. In Florida, Two of Corey's other hired guns are heading out on a new mission. It's an old beast. It's an old POS. Corey's putting them in an old beater and asking them to fly halfway around the world. How about these blades? It was a little chunky. Captain Pete Zaccanino is a test pilot, a guy who lives to fly. I love designing airplanes. I love flight testing airplanes. I love flying airplanes. I love working on airplanes. I don't think there's a better career in the world. This is one job that might change his mind. Yeah, the DA's boots are pretty chapped up here. Look at this stuff. It's old. Welcome to the 70s, baby. Check it out. Oh, daddy. You were not exaggerating. Oh, dude, from here I can see those avionics. It's a junk. It's a junk. <laughs> Probably half the LEDs are burnt out on yeah. Who knows? This 32-year-old Piper Cheyenne has been sitting in the hangar for many months. Pete's counting on his buddy Brad White to help him out on what will be a long, tough flight. We got an old Junker airplane. We're crossing a huge amount of distance in a plane that hasn't been flown for months and months. And we're going to be uh, going through some totally hairy weather. They have to fly the old bird from Florida to the Philippines crossing the wilds of Alaska and northern Russia before making a final push over open ocean to Manila. No way are these guys starting their trip without a serious test flight. All right, you ready? I'm ready. I want to find problems during the test flight. That way I can get them fixed here, good maintenance shop. I just don't want the problems to happen in the most remote place in the planet. OK, everything is green, engines look good, fuel flow is normal. When I show up to a new plane I haven't met before, it's me bonding with the airplane. It's that airplane proving that it's not going to kill me. There's 1,200. Rotate. Yep. Yep. Oh. Uh, yeah, that trim is a little funky. Yes, it is. Trim controls small flaps on the tail that are crucial for climbing and descending. Man, no, man, that is weird. And this trim is barely working. Try again, yours trim up. Yeah, it's sluggish. Yeah, that could be a showstopper if we did lose trim and controllability. That would totally suck. Yeah. A plane's trim can make the difference between life and death. If the trim tap fails, that's a serious, serious situation. The aircraft could end up nose up vertical, nose down vertical, or upside down. All very hazardous scenarios. 
Pete and Brad cut their test flight short. I'll just start down. I'll just do it. As the Cheyenne comes in for a landing, the trim decides to behave. Three green, no red, full flash, we're clear to land. All righty. But not many aviators grow old flying unreliable equipment. Well, we got a major trim problem. Yeah. So until the problem's fixed, this old bird is grounded. Twenty-seven hundred meters over Turks and Caicos. From you up the field inside. Negative, I just said there's a part of the line. The oil gauge is telling Carrie and Stu they have an overheating engine, so they're trying to land the Navajo as soon as they can. Seat belts, fuel pumps, air coming down. Ah, oh, man, gotta be kidding me. They're on final approach, but Carrie's not seeing the three green lights that indicate the landing gear is down and locked in position. Come on, give me a green. We only have two lights. Ah, son of a Dang it, dang it, dang it. All right. Now they're in double trouble. Cycle it again? Yeah, hang on. Double tower, uh, 6 there. We've got uh, only two gear lights. We're going to do a 360 and recycle our gear. OK, uh, confirm you're going to do a 360. That's permanent. By jogging the wheels up and down, they're hoping the gear will snap and lock into place. There's zero three. All right, uh, thank you. Come on, baby. Papa needs three green. One, two, negative. Two. negative. Oh, wait, we got it. You had it twisted. Looks like it was just a loose dimmer switch. <laughs> OK, turn power, power, six, four, we got three green. OK, three green. Two, seven, six, two, eight, you fit a land one, we one, two. We are clear to land. One problem solved. Now they just have to get the Navajo safely on the ground. Yeah. Well, I am really happy that uh, we have three actual wheels beneath us. Crashing is not good. Curry, helicopter 6606. All right, leg one in the can. While the plane's being refueled, they investigate. Let's take a look at that engine. Yeah. Oh, I'll record what these guys get on the fuel, too. Yeah. Well, we're going to see how much oil we got in this girl. See if that was possibly the problem. If the oil's low, yeah. it would mean the engine really was overheating. Well, I'm kind of liking what I'm seeing. I mean, it looks like we've got about 10 quarts. I don't know. We can put a couple in but she's really not burning any oil. I don't see any obvious signs of uh, overheating on the engine. You know, no, the cowling isn't discolored from overheating. The worst case is that there's a bad sensor and we can't see what the oil temperature is. And, you know, it's a judgment call from here. As near as I can tell, we're still good to go. They're feeling optimistic until they realize how much fuel they used up on this first leg. One, two, Three, four hundred. One, two, three. And there's five hundred. You can keep the rest. I'm not liking the fuel burn. That burned a lot more gas than I thought we were gonna. We, it was just over three hours here, and we only have forty gallons left, and we were not running super hard. They push on from Turks and Caicos to the Dominican Republic, and on to Aruba. There. Carrie does some new fuel range calculations. We've got to do a little checking. And Stu calls Corey to keep him in the loop. Our fuel burn, um, even at most lean, is way off on this thing. So we have to look at our legs again because our range is shorter. So it's, uh, it's not, not exactly the performer that we were hoping it would be. Let me know how it goes. Um, have a safe flight. Now their trip will take longer. So Carrie's keen to keep moving today. I'd like to uh, file our flight plan to Trinidad. When you want to leave? Uh, we're leaving soon, right now. Right yeah. now, right away. Trinidad is closed. You mean it's closed? It's an official holiday. 
So you can't leave today. That's crazy. Uh, all right, well, frustration level's running really high. As a ferry pilot, I love to put a lot of miles behind me every day. Um, I just, you know, 1,500, 2,000 miles a day, that's kind of standard. They've flown less than half of that, and with nowhere to go, the day is suddenly over. Back up in Florida, Pete and Brad are even worse off. Stuck at zero altitude and zero speed with a trim control they don't trust. I'm eager to hear if we need parts for the plane. Yep. They're stuck with this Piper Cheyenne, an old bird in desperate need of a good mechanic. I do not see anything binding or slipping in the actual mechanical control wheel. You don't see that play where you got to you got to roll it an inch or two before it starts. Yeah, but that's you. normal in some airplanes, especially when you have that electric trim. All right, yeah, I've never seen that before. If you, it's not very common. Yeah. Flown a lot of different airplanes, never seen a loose one like that. Well, so. I think that's normal for you to have a little play in your trim wheel. The maintenance manual says it's good. You're airworthy. Gabe, the mechanic, thinks the trim is working fine, but he's not the one who'll be flying the plane 7,000 meters up in the air. Mechanics have killed plenty of aircraft and their crew and passengers because they've made mistakes. Mechanics are humans and they make errors, just like pilots. There's some old going on in here. I just wanted to get a look at this system. It's old, it's beat up, and um, who knows what's going what's gonna to surface today, tomorrow, halfway around the world. Like it or not, their departure is set for 6 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with this plane, is getting it to the Philippines. Yeah, I appreciate the help. But as soon as they settle in to catch up on some calls, they get an urgent message from Gabe, the mechanic. I see him. I yeah, see what I think I see. I see two puddles of liquid that is certainly not hydraulic. That is absolutely yeah. jet A. Gabe, I talk know. to us. Yeah. Hey, no. how you doing? Uh, this doesn't look uh, good, buddy. No, no, it's not good at all, actually. To be honest, uh, the issue we're having now is we've topped off your, your left and right fuel tanks, yeah. tips, and as well as the nacelle tanks. And this is your nacelle tank back here right. behind back the here. engine. And uh, what I see now is you have a leak coming, a fuel leak. I see it. Coming from your left-hand nacelle tank. I see it. And it's running down a wire bundle. Oh, that's great. That's horrible. It's unbelievable. The fuel's running down this wing pan right here, and it's coming into these drain holes in the bottom of the fuselage. Dude, that's a huge fire hazard. Huge fire hazard. It's coming down. Holy horse What's the fix for this? Our best bet, actually, is to get a professional in here. Fuel tank expert. Most pilots are pretty good with a wrench, but when it comes to fuel problems, even the best like to delegate. If the expert comes in tonight and discovers that we have a bad fuel tank, this trip is not happening. Let's see what you got. So it should be back here, huh? A Gabriel, he's going to blow some compressed air in there, and then I'm going to I'm going to start looking around and see if I can see where this air is escaping from. Hold on, I just saw something right there. Okay, that tells me something. That's someone. money right there. Right. See, see the bubble? It's an old and reliable trick. Blow in some air and let the bubbles give away the leak. The conduit right here is where the fuel's leaking. Coming through. Yeah. Yeah. See it. Lucky thing, Brad and Pete decided to fill up tonight instead of tomorrow. If we'd have fueled in the morning, we'd have put the fuel in, taken off, blasted off on our way, and been sitting on, gee, why are we using up so much fuel at the very least? And in the worst case scenario, an onboard fire. My confidence in this plane, every time it comes up two or three notches, it gets dropped down like five. At last, the fuel expert comes back with the verdict on the leak repair. A little good news and some bad news. Bad news. Yeah. That's usually how it goes. Yeah, well, it's aviation for you I'm in the middle of the night. Um, we got a nut plate, which is going to be relatively easy to fix. And then we have a uh, probe. It looks like it's cracked. We'll have to get a new one. and. You know, really can't do much with parts right now until tomorrow morning. So you're saying anywhere from a couple hours delay to maybe a full day? I would be willing to bet you're probably looking at leaving the following day. 
It's the same story every time. It's not your fault, you know? Just this gets so old. Next morning, Pete and Brad head back to the hangar, hoping for good news on the parts. Let's see if we can find Gabe. What's up, Gabe? Hey, what's Brad. Shaking, hey, good morning. What's, what's the deal with this guy? The good news is we did find a fuel probe in Florida. Ah, very cool. The bad news, unfortunately, is it's in northern Florida, and it won't be able to be here till tomorrow morning, guys. Are you serious? That's not going to work. We, we need to get something. I mean, that's a day and a half behind. But we got to figure out a solution, because this is getting ridiculous. The best ferry pilots will do almost anything to keep flying, even if it means renting a plane and picking up the part themselves in northern Florida. Yeah, hi. Wondering if you guys have some aircraft rentals. Is that the best you can do? That's pretty steep. That would be huge. Pete has just caught a lucky break. What's up, man? OK, I called my buddy. He said, no, nah, don't worry about that. I'll fly over there to their airport, pick up the part, just have it ready, give me the details. So it down to you guys, have it here tonight. That's huge. It is huge. Yeah, Jim's really hooking us up. All he wants is fuel. Pay for the fuel. Don't worry about aircraft cost. On his way. You know, aviation is a really small world, and uh, Pete's pretty big in that small world, so it's not surprising that, he got, that he's got people like that that'll help him out. Three hours later, Pete's pal shows up with the missing part. Hey, Jim. Hey, Pete, it's you again. Hey, yeah, you here. made it. Awesome. There you go, buddy. Thank nice. you, sir. You really saved us, and that's a huge deal. Thanks. Just the girls in the <laughs> Safe flight. We'll see you later. Check All it out, time. dude. Now you guys have to work your magic. We need that in tonight, test it, filled with fuel, and make sure it's good. Looks like you guys will be getting out of here on time tomorrow. Yes. Down in South America, Carrie knows that the next leg of their flight can be deadly. If we get to the point of no return and we're screwed, you know, we're going to be looking for options. It's almost 1,000 kilometers from Georgetown, Guyana, over nonstop Amazon jungle to Macapá, Brazil. This is the long one, kind of the dangerous one, because there's no airports in between, nowhere to go. If we have a problem when we're out of range of coming of either airport from going down in the Amazon. Y'all set, Stu? Let's do it. Then we get to test our survival skills. They'll be pushing the absolute limit of the fuel range for the Navajo. It's already burning more than it should. 30 gallons an hour will give us maybe 45 minute reserve today, which is not even close to what I would like to have. If we have an engine problem and we have to dodge thunderstorms, we're going to be in trouble. So we're really just kind of crossing our fingers on this one and going for it. 85 coming up. I'll take the gear. Gear up. We got some time to make up. We do. An airport holiday yesterday in Trinidad put them behind schedule. That's why they're gunning it today. This thing is uh, turbocharged. It goes a little faster, and we get just a little bit more range the higher we go. So you know, let's see what that does. I say we just do it. Hang on, a couple of bumps. Woo! There we go. <laughs> the weather isn't doing them any favors. These headwinds get any worse, we're screwed. That is slow. We got to be pushing a 35 mile headwind. They're slowing down and using a lot more fuel than they'd planned. That's not good. Keep an eye on that fuel pressure, because you know if that thing sputters while we're on approach, we got to we got to go to those boost pumps right away. Okay. 36.6 miles. Come on, baby. Now the engines are sucking in the tank's reserves. I'm putting my shoulder harness on now. <sighs> Probably not a bad idea. At least one of the engines should still be running by the time we get there, but they're running pretty low, so I really hope we make it. Oh, there we go. There's... That's one engine sputtering. These pumps on. We have fuel pressure. They managed to pump just enough fuel to the engine to keep it going. My cup of control, November 27608. Uh, like priority landing, uh, fuel critical. 23 miles from a 
Right ox tank's dead. Now we're on the right main tank, and that one doesn't have much gas in it either, so. Kerry knows he has to nail the landing, because this time, there's no second chance. Come on, come on, come on, come on. OK, pre-landing checklist, gas, not much on the fullest tanks. Undercarriage, down, three green, one in the window. Fuel pump's on. Mixture's full rich, fuel pump's on. Just a little bit more. So I think we're high enough to glide in there now, if we lose an engine. Yeah, if this quits now, I'm aiming right for the end of the runway. Coming full flaps. I think I got the runway made. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Nice, 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 nice. Flaps, not the air, the flaps. Boost pumps off. Back on the ground. Safe and sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've been this happy to put my feet on the ground. Yeah, no doubt. A little, uh, let's see, buzz check. Not too bad, not too bad. That was intense, but, you know, the fact is we have two more, possibly two more legs left today, and you got to have a clear head to do it, so we need to reset and, um, and try to get back in the air as soon as possible. Stu and Carrie are still 4,000 kilometers from their delivery target in Argentina, with only three days to go. All right. Corey made some promises to the new owners, and he's really counting on me to get it done and keep his promise for him. This plane needs to get down there fast. 4,000 kilometers north. All right, you ready? I'm ready. The Cheyenne's fuel leak has been repaired. So Pete and Brad are finally taking off. Morning runway five. Base caution for birds on us in the airport. They have a giant marathon ahead of them, 16,000 kilometers, from the sandy beaches of Florida all the way to the Philippine jungles. Yes, the redoodle. Next stop's only eight hours away. Today, they'll fly 3,300 kilometers and stop in Utah to refuel. At least, that was the plan. Because now, the Cheyenne is showing her age all over again. Got ice all over this windscreen and it sucks. I can't see anything. Nothing. No heater. See the heater? Nothing. There's no heater. Up at 7,000 meters, the temperature outside drops to negative 30 degrees Celsius. And that cold is seeping into the cabin. We got things freezing up. We got nuts and bolts freezing up. We got a windshield that won't defrost. It's just one thing after another. Let me start making a list, dude, because this is crap. Here, why don't we start here with the LEDs you said are burnt out? OK, LEDs. I'm going to put heater slash defrost, because. Yeah, the defrost. We have a multitude of avionics problems going on up here. Yes. Things that are in-op, they're not labeled in-op. Prop the ice. I wonder if I should even go there. Not now. Please don't do it. <laughs> If the de-icers don't de-ice the props, flying across Alaska and northern Russia will be a game of airborne Russian roulette, because the icy conditions can shoot them down almost anywhere. I have zero confidence in this aircraft right now. Yeah. I will not fly this at night. I will not fly this in the weather. I will not fly this into ice right now, period. I'm pretty much on board with that. As soon as this plane touches down, she's headed straight back to the hangar with just one-fifth of the journey behind her and 13,000 kilometers to go. In Brazil, Carrie and Stu are down to a tight two-day deadline to deliver the Navajo to Argentina. But Stu's just met a guy who can help them big time. From Macapá to Foz in Brazil. Uh-huh. Going this way, 1,601. The, one, the direct was 15... Yeah, 15, 15 something. something, yeah. Jonas is a Brazilian ferry pilot who's also delivering a plane to Argentina. 1,545. That's three legs. Direct. That's three legs. 3,500 each. He knows the back routes well, 
and he's offering to fly them over some shortcuts that'll save them a huge whack of time. We really uh, scored. Having a native to escort you is unbelievably lucky. So that's why I really love ferry flying. I love going to the small airports and meeting all the, all the pilots. You know, I don't like going to big international airports and meeting bureaucrats. That's just painful. It's like getting a root canal. Being able to fly to smaller airports, just get fuel, no flight plan, be on our way. It's huge. It's the biggest scoop of this whole trip. What's your altitude at 2992? Oh, there he is. Just about 2,500. All uh, right, we got you. See him? Oh, yeah, I got him. All right, we got you, thanks. And you got the next airport on the, on the GPS? From Macapá, Jonas will take them to a tiny airport in Araguana, way off the beaten path. It's much more direct than the route Carrie and Stu had planned. The other frequency now is one, two, three, four, five. That's the frequency for the airport? Yeah, that's the frequency for all uncontrolled airports. I never thought I'd make it here. Never knew it existed. There you go, beautiful. Turn and burn in and out. Not a bureaucrat in sight. The fastest stop of the entire trip. Uh, it's amazing. For the first time since Stu and Carrie hit the clouds, they've got a decent chance of making good on Corey's promise to deliver this Navajo to its owner on time. Now all they have to do is keep up with their new friend. For nine hours, Pete and Brad have pushed this limping Cheyenne across the Midwest. Holy cow, my feet are, I think, frozen to the floor. And that's with a, a newspaper insulator. And that floor is colder, because I don't have the sun here now either. Just add it to the list of the other stuff that uh, the mechanics got to look at when we get to Utah. Their Utah pit stop is home base for boss Corey Benson. They can't wait to unload on him. I'm looking forward to passing him the keys and saying, all right, we made it this far. It's yours. Good luck, sucker. Good luck, sucker. Now you can see what you gave us to drive halfway around the world. Corey's waiting when they land. You made it! Knowing he's about to get an earful. Oh, we made it. How's the flight in? It's got all kinds of weird, weird quirks. There's problems with the avionics, the autopilot. There's no heat in it, so we're frozen. Well, I'm frozen right the now. The right windshield just turns to a sheet of ice. Pete's sitting there scraping it the whole flight. Is that on new issues after the test flight? Yeah. It's, it's old and tired. Corey has to get this delivery back on track. His pilots get paid, even for down days. It all comes out of Corey's $25,000 fee. It just barely got off the ground and, and hasn't even made it halfway across the country yet. We're already experiencing some major issues. It's got me a little nervous. With the help of Jonas, the Brazilian ferry pilot, Stu and Carrie have crossed this country in record time. And to their surprise, that means the Navajo flight is now ahead of schedule. Yeah, we just landed down here in the Brazilian border at Fao, what is it? Uh, Fazi Guzul. Fazi, Fazi Guzul. Only three hours from delivery, they need Corey to confirm the drop-off point. Got refueled, and uh, we're just giving you a call to uh, see what our uh, what the latest Perfect. is. Perfect. Um, the day one flight to continue to a private airstrip in Rosario. There will not be customs at this airstrip. I'm um, showing you the coordinates right now. To these guys, landing without clearing customs sounds dodgy. Do they have this covered with the government already, or are we? I mean, because that's an illegal. Landing. I understand where you're coming from, and I can answer that question for you. 
you might need that. If you guys give Franco a call directly, I'll send you the other one to follow up and change it. Please give me. Yeah. Okay, guys. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye. Like, <sighs> that is. That sounds like the craziest thing that happened the entire trip. Entering a country without. <laughs> Clearing customs. Well, I don't know what they call it in Argentina, but it's a felony in the United States. And as pilots, we definitely have to follow some very specific rules, especially if we want to stay pilots, for one, and not go to jail, too. They've pushed themselves to the limit the last six days. They're only a thousand kilometers from the finish line, but they refuse to risk everything for Corey's client. I'm not going into that private strip, no matter what he says. That's just stupid. We're... <laughs> We'll get busted, nah. It doesn't take long for the owner to come up with a new game plan. I mean, we will try to take off earlier, but we still have to clear customs and immigration, yeah. pay landing fees, flight plan. Yeah, I'll be at you, but I'll pick you up. OK, that will work. Thank you, Finko. Bye-bye. He's gotten rid of the dirt strip behind his buddy's plantation or something. Who knows what it was? So now we're going to the international airport. We're getting customs. Everything's great, so very cool. Back on track. With a squeaky clean and legal landing all lined up, Stu and Carrie start off on the last leg of their trip. I will get the gear. Finish line, now just three hours away. Back up north in Utah. Brad and Corey are trying to sort out some of the problems with the Cheyenne. And we're going to double check that heater and all the de-icing stuff and make sure it works. Ice cold temperatures in the cockpit on the first leg of the trip could be an ominous warning of a more serious problem. Just seeing if it's going to heat up. If there's no heat hitting the propellers or wings, even the thinnest layer of ice can alter the aerodynamics. Nothing on this, Brad. Enough to turn the Cheyenne into a kamikaze dive bomber. Well, we've got some pretty major issues. Um, I'm going to have to call the owner. He's going to be super frustrated. But these are just out of our control. Part of the challenge of ferry flying, especially older planes like this, if something can break, it will break. Hello, Edwin. It's Corey Benson with CB Aviation. How are you? We've got some pretty major problems with the airplane. It's just absolutely not safe for these guys to continue on um, how it is. For now, the Cheyenne is Corey's problem. We'll get you briefed on the safety, the seat belts. Corey isn't the only one based in Utah. Parachute. Pete lives here too. And so does his personal training jet, the Aero L39 Albatross. A couple things, throttle, you know what that is. Fuel on and off. Don't touch that, please. OK. This jettisons the canopy. We pull that handle all the way down. Can't be able to just fly away. Grab the handle and release it, and the parachute will open. Handle. That one, that one forward. Boom. Upside down, we're out. Yep. I'm totally pumped. I'm not sure what to expect, but uh, you know, the plane looks awesome. Brad's flown a few jets, but he's never been taught what to do when that jet's out of control in the wrong position. This is super important training. Every pilot should do it. It just teaches you how to recover an airplane if it's upside down, if it's nose straight up, nose straight down. It kills a lot of pilots. Here we go, huh? I love the view, too. How much did you load it up there when you pitched up to 45? Uh, about three feet. That was awesome, dude. OK, you got the aircraft? I've got it. OK, full aileron left or right. Oh, sorry. That's OK, that's all right. Sweet. Roll it out level. Isn't that cool? Woo-hoo! <laughs> I'm digging it. They're rolling birdies. I'm going to float it down to the horizon. That's about good. Now roll back. Dude, how cool is that? Isn't that bitchin'? That's bitchin'. Yeah, that was awesome, dude. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yep. 
That's a good sign right there. <laughs> I could feel when we were loading up a little negative. Yeah. Like when we were coming through, that's when I was just like, whoa. <laughs> All right, I earned the hat then. <laughs> All right. Pretty sweet, wasn't it? That was sweet, man. Yeah. God, I can't believe how it flies. Yeah, it's cool. It's so easy. Yeah. Yeah, it, it makes was awesome. it easy. Yep. It's been a great break from flying the Cheyenne, but by this time tomorrow, if Corey manages to get the heater working, these two pilots will be sky high, back in the old bird again, where almost anything can happen. There'll be a ticker tape parade here. I want to see streamers, confetti guns. There it is. Woo! After three hours of smooth sailing, Stu and Carrie are about to make good on Corey's promise and deliver the Navajo on time. They've made it all the way from the United States through South America to Argentina in only six days. Well, when, yeah, it takes up You're coming down. 110. Got it. Uh, 105. Got it. Oh. Touchdown! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Navajo to Rosario. After 9,000 kilometers in the air, pushing the Navajo to the limit, it's finally home. Hola, como esta? <laughs> we bien. We're here, us in the plane, we're here in one piece, it's good. Nice job, dude. All right, man. Killed it. Trip. I'm feeling pretty good. It was a long and tough one, that's for darn sure, but it uh, feels good to get the plane in the owner's hands and turn your back on it, go home. Pete and Brad know this Cheyenne will never fly like yesterday's L-39 jet. But Corey and the mechanic did get the prop de-icers working. Hey, John, what's the word? Hey, Brad, hey, Pete. We found that there was a couple of loose ground wires to okay. the uh, de-ice boots on the props. So we uh, tightened those up, did another test, and there they worked. The safety problem is out of the way, but that's small comfort because the cabin is still cold as a beer cooler. We need the heater. It's way too cold, and we got way too long to go, so. So we're doing a little troubleshooting here to try and figure out what in the system is not working. Hey, John, I'm feeling heat on the floor. Oh, yeah, the floor's getting warm. Yeah, it, it's totally working fine. That's great news. That's totally good news. That's Man, it's news. pumping like crazy. It feels great. Yeah, that's a relief. The last thing on their list is the avionics, the electronic systems that control many of the aircraft's mechanical functions. With so many things breaking down, Pete and Brad have never had time to test them properly. Ready? I'm ready. But this time, they can't even get off the ground. Oh. I got a reverser lock light, and I have this flickering. This is really strange. We got that beta light flashing. It's a light that indicates the propellers are in the beta range, which is the reverse. And uh, having the engine allow the propeller to go into reverse in flight is extremely hazardous. See if he answers it Sunday. And he doesn't know my number. This is Corey. Hey, Corey, it's Brad and Pete. How you doing? What's going on, boys? The plane is giving us an indication that there's something wrong with the beta on the left engine. The plan of action. John is on it right now. Corey's got the maintenance manual out, and, and it's repeating the problem, so it, it's not intermittent. Um, we'll just keep you updated. Okay, perfect. All right, see, see ya. You know what? I mean, I, this is no joke. I don't have three months to go limping across the planet with this thing. <laughs> Next time on Dangerous Flights. I'm getting so Can bored. somebody tell me what the heck? Pete and Brad are running out of patience with the old bird. The technologically advanced aircraft. Oh, you're telling me you'd like to be captain. Carrie and Stu battle for control of the captain seat. Easy there, Hoss. Okay, easy to be. You're the one with the hand on throttle. And bad weather is endangering both flights. You gonna be able to see anything, dude? I don't mind rain much at all, but lightning's bad. 